There's been many animated incarnations of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles over the years, but the very original series came out in 1987. This was a smash hit, exploding in merchandise and a brand that's recognised even today. So naturally, it was shown in other countries. After all, that's how I saw it here in England. However, the version we got in the UK was weirdly different. They weren't Ninja Turtles, they were Hero Turtles. But why? The short answer is British media censored the word ninja, but that strikes me as being a bit too short. Like, why? What series of events led to the UK being so scared of ninjas? And the reason behind it turned out to be something of a rabbit hole. Or should I say a turtle hole? No, I shouldn't say that. Starting in the 1960s, British school teacher Mary Whitehouse campaigned against the perceived rise of bad language, violence and sex on TV. There was a general view by the right wing in the 1960s that Britain was becoming a permissive society, marking the death of a moral and respectable Britain. Good. Perish. So the Queen of Clean set out on a moral crusade to save our souls by fighting Doctor Who? What's going on? Yeah, so among the many things she rallied against, she called Doctor Who Tea Time Brutality for Tots, and that one episode contained some of the sickest and most horrific material seen on children's television. Wow, what episode was that? The brain of Morbius? God, that guy just can't catch a break, can he? It's Morbin time. But Mary Whitehouse's persistence was working. Her complaints led to episodes being re-edited, the series being moved to a later time slot, and subsequent episodes were explicitly instructed to tone down the violence. Oh look, it's a piece of media intended for younger viewers being permanently altered because of a moral outcry. I wonder if this will come up again later. She may have been a figure of ridicule, but she was winning. And the impact that media had on children was a subject of growing public concern, especially for conservative-leaning people, such as the Video Nasties. Video Nasties, the Home Secretary says he won't change the law to ban them altogether. In the 1970s, the VCR was introduced to the UK and films were released on VHS without age rating, so anyone could buy any movie at any age. The exception to this was erotic films, which fell under the Obscene Publications Act, which banned videos that tend to deprave and corrupt persons who are likely to read, see, or hear the matter contained or embodied in it. Video hire shops were often raided to seize these obscene videos, including The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, a Dolly Parton musical that was definitely not a porn movie. The problem with this description of what defines an obscene video was really vague and Mary Whitehouse took full advantage of this as she pushed for more and more videos to be also seized, not for being pornographic, but for being obscene. This included Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Scanners, Rosemary's Killer, Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th Part 2, and Mary's number one nasty, The Evil Dead. These weren't technically banned, but police could seize them at their discretion, all to generally discourage video dealers so they wouldn't bother going through all the trouble of trying to sell them. But this still created a frenzy in the tabloids. This would eventually change thanks to the Video Recordings Act of 1984, which would now add a age rating system to video releases, just like cinema releases. Now, I don't think this is such a bad thing. Protecting really young kids from accidentally seeing a film they're not ready for is a pretty solid reason for age rating systems on videos. And obviously, I've seen movies rated 18 when I was under 18. We all have. But I like that there's at least some guidance on what to expect. And I'd rather have a film rated for adults instead of being banned just because a teenager's head got a little bit removed. But that's the thing. The goal of this war on video nasties wasn't to protect the children. It was to get these movies taken away from everyone. And these are some of the most important movies in the history of horror, further cementing just how out of touch the attitude towards them were. Which, get this, she never watched in the first place. I have never seen a video nasty. I actually don't need to see visually what I know is in that film. In 1973, Stanley Kubrick insisted on removing A Clockwork Orange in just England after his family received threats of violence while he was being accused of a film that would inspire acts of violence. Huh. 
Indeed, there were a lot of real-life murders and massacres that would be blamed on the influence of violent movies. Research is taking place and it will show that these films not only affect young people, but I believe they affect adults as well. Wait, did he just say dogs or adults? But I believe they affect adults as well. Dogs? Affect dogs as well. Dogs? Dogs. 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 Dogs? Dogs as well. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he said dogs. So yeah, they got the blame based on studies that were often just made up, like a survey done to see if children had watched these video nasties, a study used by many political figures in arguments against them, except... What we do is made up film titles, and when we gave that to school children, we found two thirds of them claimed they'd seen films which never exist. I think this unproven speculation about videos influencing real world violence is more gross than anything these films showed. Because just like blaming heavy metal music or video games, it just lets mass murderers get away with being merely innocent victims who were just under a bad influence. Society will always want to blame others because it cannot blame itself for making the monster. There is a rising level of violence in society and people are worried by it. It's very easy to look for something which actually has virtually no connection at all with what's going on and say, let's blame it on that. I don't deny the effectiveness of these films. I knew somebody who stopped taking baths after seeing Nightmare on Elm Street. Obviously, media has an effect on your behaviour. That's how advertising works. Get Surfshark today. But a film toying with your emotions can't just uncharacteristically alter you to do things you weren't already inclined to do. As Kubrick said, to attribute powerful suggestive qualities to a film is at odds with the scientifically accepted view that even after deep hypnosis, in a post-hypnotic state, people cannot be made to do things which are at odds with their natures. Basically, if a movie, a game, or a song was going to make them do it, they were probably going to do it anyway. This is a classic example of a moral panic. A moral panic is a means to drum up fear that some evil is a threat to society, and it's a tool that politicians fucking love to use. Because you not only get to invent a problem, you also get to solve it, and win a lot of votes in the process. And it worked for Margaret Thatcher. But now, a word from our sponsor. Well, if you ask me, I think the terrible problems afflicting the United Kingdom today are not these video nasties, it's not Doctor Whom, and for once we cannot blame it all on poor people. Personally, I blame Surfshark VPN. They are, of course, a virtual private network, and because of them, myself and other politicians cannot see their data, even on public Wi-Fi, which means they could be looking up all sorts of things on the internet in complete secrecy from the government. Like how to overthrow the government and become a homosexual. And it's through this that users can access content not available in their country. Look, state censorship doesn't work if you could just hop over to one of their 3200 servers in over 90 countries and see whatever video nasty you want. What if you saw a breast? What then? So our warning to the people is that there is a link in the description and by using the promo code EDIG you will get 83% off your subscription plus three months extra for free. And this surf shark will not only affect young people but I believe they affect dogs as well. Oh, a booby! <laughs> James Furman, director of the BBFC at the time, was pretty lenient when it came to film classifications. One infamous example is Salo, or The 120 Days of Sodom, a film known for its extreme violence, f***ing, f***ing, and eating. Furman allowed it exclusively for private club cinemas, even though the police would still seize it. James Furman seemed to really understand the artistic intent, even in extreme examples like this. However, the headlines at six o'clock. An armed man has opened fire with an automatic weapon in a Berkshire town. At least nine people are dead. Fourteen are injured. In 1987, Michael Ryan shot 31 people, killing 16 of them, including his own mother, and then himself. The Hungerford Massacre remains one of the UK's deadliest mass shootings. No motive was ever confirmed, but people blamed violent movies, such as... Rambo. For my impression, there were people who were saying he was playing Rambo. The events in Hungerford clearly shook James Furman, as he's the guy in charge of certifying films. 
He's basically something of an arbiter of British culture, so he must have felt some partial responsibility for what happened. Because following this, coupled with the ongoing tabloid pressure of video nasties, he clamped down hard on violence and weapons despite artistic intent. Such as rating Rambo 3 with an 18, despite it really being a 15, even with cuts. Which is just sad. This coincided well with the policies of Margaret Thatcher. She was seen as the solution for the permissive society and led with the hardline policies of law and order, especially against deadly weapons. You see, when Enter the Dragon came out in 1973, it was a worldwide sensation. Bruce Lee's posthumous masterpiece became one of the most influential films of all time, sparking a trend of other martial arts movies and TV shows to follow. I was so close to becoming the ultimate ninja! And the British press, once again, had a moral panic about it. This follows from a high-profile case in the 60s after a kitchen hand learned karate from a book and used it to murder his colleague. Apparently, within three seconds, he'd killed the man stone dead. This brought into question the safety of this karate, suggesting a potential full ban on the practice. And now here's even more martial arts, this time with weapons, and they're being sold in shops. They're even available by mail order. But like with the video nasties, the angle became, what if a child got hold of a throwing star? Like, obviously, that's bad, but by positioning the story in such a biased way, it becomes impossible to argue against. Oh, what? You want little babies playing with ninja stars? Little ninja babies? Little ninja babies playing little ninja stars? Oh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but once again, the plan was to ban it for everyone. Home Office Minister John Patton said, They have no part to play in civilised society. No civilised person should wish to possess them. Oh, but I thought everyone was kung fu fighting. <laughs> so, okay. Were there any high-profile cases of an attack in the UK using ninja weapons? Nope, not that I could find. I found articles about confiscating weapons and suspected weapons, and while I don't doubt somebody probably attacked somebody with a weapon at some point, it hardly seemed to be as widespread as the press was suggesting. The Home Office's public crime record of possessions of weapons only starts from 1998 due to the changes on how crimes were counted. Crime statistics do show a general increase in the 80s and the 90s, but that's of all crimes, with or without weapons. And while we don't exactly want a kid to be killed by a throwing star to only then act upon it, other than sensationalist articles, I'm not finding much to actually support the paranoia of ninja weapons. What did happen, however, were riots. Lots and lots of riots. With a hard line on law and order, police were allowed to do random stop and searches, and by random I mean mostly black people, called the sus law. This was a thing. So the growing mistrust of the police saw the rise in tension become riots in Brixton in 1981, and then again in 1985, and then the miners' strike. Basically, Thatcher was very good at pissing off a lot of people. So I think a motivating factor of the Offensive Weapons Act in 1988, with the inclusion of ninja weapons, was to try and undermine the fighting power of the rioters, just before the poll tax riots kicked off. Similarly, Thatcher had a heavy-handed approach when it came to football hooliganism, and how they were allegedly bringing ninja throwing stars to football matches. Hooliganism was such a huge concern for Thatcher that the increased police powers to control the violence resulted in one of the deadliest football events ever. The Hillsborough disaster of 1989, in which Liverpool supporters were crushed by overcrowding, resulted in 97 deaths. Despite this being proven to be caused by the actions of the police, the right-wing press was quick to put the blame on the victims. This is so demonstrably untrue that the Sun newspaper continues to be boycotted in Liverpool to this day. Good. So many were clutching at their pearls, worried about these unruly mobs of rural rioters. So just as there was a ban on these weapons in the real world, there were also bans on these weapons in movies and TV. And James Furman was taking a stance against nunchucks. When Enter the Dragon had a 1988 VHS release, Bruce Lee's iconic nunchuck scene was cut. The cover had to be altered. That just looks like a baguette. Even this scene with a poster of Bruce Lee just holding nunchucks had to be cut too. Someday I'm gonna be just like him. So for ninja weapons, despite having no real inciting moment beyond the popularity of Bruce Lee, a moral panic was once again created. One that created laws and legislations that made the Thatcher government look great because they were firm and unwavering, all in the name of keeping the peace and saving the children. And unfortunately, this was the sorry state of Britain when the turtles hit our shores. Cowabama.
Oh, those poor turtles. They didn't stand a chance. <laughs> Drawing clear influence from the martial art classics like Bruce Lee with 80s action movie attitude, the Turtles were set to take the world by storm. But the UK was between moral panics of how the media affects kids, ninja weapons and fighting in the streets. And although Thatcher was on her way out, the Turtles couldn't have come at a worse time. But with a huge franchise and merchandise opportunities, the Turtles could not not come to the UK, so they had to comply with the censorship changes, and they were brutal. Following the cuts from Enter the Dragon, Michelangelo wasn't allowed to have his iconic nunchucks, meaning they had to be constantly removed with some really bad edits. I wanna play dirty, huh? Strike one, dude. Strike two. You think so? So you wanna play dirty, huh? You think so? And there was, of course, the name. Remember, we're the Crooked Ninja Turtle Gang. Here's our card. We're the Crooked Turtle Gang. Here's our card. Ninjas couldn't be seen to be glorified to kids, so they were awkwardly renamed heroes. We never got this cool swirly logo, we got this janky edited version. Look at this mess! What is this lettering? This bit of the T has fallen off. Why is it so weirdly fuzzy? And it's not even straight! Yeah. Even the live action show, The Next Mutation, you know, the one that added the fifth turtle, Venus. <sighs> they too had to have the Ninja Hero name change. Although the censors had no control over video games, the hero moniker was kept, presumably for brand recognition. Dude, I could be gaming. The movies, however, were allowed to remain ninjas, but still faced severe cuts, to the point where other members of the BBFC challenged James Furman, saying the film had been ruined in the process, but the anti-nunchuck ruling remained. Ah, oh, a fellow chucker, eh? The second Ninja Turtles movie, The Secret of the Ooze, faced a lot of problems. Parental groups said the first film was too dark, there were school bans, and even toy companies pressured the sequel to be much lighter with the violence significantly watered down. And it still didn't work. Aside from the mixed reviews, it faced the silliest cut in the history of British cinema. At one point, Michelangelo uses sausages like nunchucks. You're probably already guessing where this is going. They're clearly not nunchucks. They're sausages. Perfectly safe, unless you're a pig. But because he used them like nunchucks, James Furman insisted that even the sausages got the chop. And despite everything, despite all the cuts and changes, the Ninja Turtles, I mean the Hero Turtles, were still an absolute sensation. Turtle Mania swept across the UK, and how did the press react to this? Can you guess? Go on, have a guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's another moral panic. <laughs> Yay. It seems every classroom in Britain is hit by turtle mania. Turtle mania. Turtle mania. Turtle mania is sweeping Britain. They are teaching violence to our children. It almost becomes like a drug. You can't enjoy that massive diet of violent entertainment and not be affected. Comic heroes like the turtles can be a threat to young minds. There was a surge of kids getting real turtles and terrapins to have, not as pets, but as toys, leading to many animal suffering. Many were dumped in lakes, but some of them survived and are still there now. Also, don't dump unwanted animals, you fucks! There was also the fear that these animals could carry salmonella, which was a whole other panic the UK was having at the same time. The popularity of pizza partnered well with another panic, this time about obesity in children. And there was one really bizarre trend of kids <sighs> climbing inside sewers. The council knows it has a battle on its hands trying to stop children climbing into sewer drains. Children had actually taken wood into the sewers and what looked to us to be a, a den. An ordinary manhole cover like this one had to be cemented over after small children climbed down inside and built a den. Hey, I was a kid of the 90s. I like turtles. I like turtles. But I would never go into some shit smelling hole in the ground just because I might meet Donatello. But April O'Neil? No, that's upgraded to a maybe. It seems weird, but it cannot be understated how much of a huge craze the turtles were. But was this really the show's fault? 
didn't the parents buy all those terrapins? And to blame the show or the movies for kids injuring themselves and worse just for playing make-believe games is just bad faith. No film that teaches violence powerfully should be given a PG rating. At what age would you let your children see Ninja Turtles? <laughs> I wouldn't let them at any age. What's that? That sounds like banning it for everyone again. Hooray! So the story behind the turtles in the UK is a complicated one. To be clear, this isn't a case of the British being overly sensitive and for all the loud outcrying voices, there were just as many pointing out that the concerns were baseless. Professor Stanley Cohen explains the stages of moral panics. One, something is defined as a threat. Two, threat is simplified and amplified by mass media. Three, the public feels anxious. Four, leaders create a solution to the threat. Five, the threat is no longer a threat. He adds, Sometimes the object of the panic is quite novel and at other times it's something which has been in existence for long enough but suddenly appears in the limelight. Sometimes the panic passes over and is forgotten except in folklore and collective memory and at other times it has more serious and long-lasting repercussions and might produce such changes as those in legal and social policy or even the way that society conceives itself. We can look back on all this turtle stuff as all being very silly, but there's always a moral panic trying to emotionally manipulate you. Be it a panic about The Simpsons, video games, or trans people who just want to exist. As I've shown, moral panics are heavily used for political point scoring by weaponizing outrage to win votes. They may seem goofy in hindsight, but this tactic is nothing new, is still going, and can cost lives. So, the next time some conservative complains about free speech, tell them to be shut the fuck up, or be shut the fuck up. Tonight I dine on turtle soup. Don't forget to check out Surfshark and a special shout out to this month's patrons. Joe Wood, James Junk, Ashley Kinder, Rusty Robot, Setsune Wave, Jake Pinkerton, Alex Weston, Ashley Bird McCarthy, Liam Deeney, Lyra Fay, Mo Alcasemi, Sloan Schoolcraft, Drifter Wolf, Vinny Fex, Matthew Smith, Brett Halford, Clam Wamsley, Nathan Chominati, Mark Hunnard, Ninja Squid 2000, and Joel the Gay Noodle Jennings. And if you would like to support me, then please consider doing so on Patreon. 